when I think of forgiveness, not as a one-time event, but as an ongoing posture of live to forgive and as an ongoing posture of not just repenting now, but repenting kind of always when I see that little part of me, ah, oh, there it is again, I want to take control. I need to remember that uh, I can control things sometimes, but I need to love people. I can fix things sometimes, but I need to love people, not fix things and fix people. Well, I want to fix things and love people. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today, we talk with two guests from different walks of life who share their heartaches and scars with others so they can be encouraged to find their way. Pastor and writer Mark Eaton and country music singer-songwriter Kelsey Lamb. First up, Mark Eaton has a 35-year history in nonprofit and ministry efforts, from directing a wilderness camping program for delinquent youth to consulting and mentoring business leaders to pioneering a regional men's ministry in the Northwest. Mark also tours with his wife, Susie McIntyre Eaton, who has a thriving music ministry. Mark's road to ministry wasn't easy. Growing up with a strict father shaped his view of God as a judge, and Mark never felt he measured up. He compensated by achieving in multiple areas, all in an attempt to receive the approval he craved. But there was always a hole in his life, one that needed to be filled by the love of a father. Hi, my name is Mark Eaton. I'm a Seattle native. Uh, actually north of Seattle in the great state of Washington and moved to Oklahoma because I was lucky enough to marry Susie McIntyre. I was born in 1956 uh, in the northwest corner of the uh, northwest state of Washington, so right up by the Canadian border. My mom, strangely enough, was a North Carolina Southern Belle who had come to the state of Washington with her uh, uncle, who was an evangelistic Southern Baptist preacher. Dad uh, was six foot three and uh, came off the farm, uh, and he knew all that uh, uh, of the ranch and farm things that he grew up with, like so many did in those days. He went to World War II in the Coast Guard and was a pretty rough northwest rivers, mountain logging, fishing kind of guy. And here comes uh, uh, Anna Laura Sherrill from uh, rural North Carolina. And uh, they met. It's a, it's, a, it's a great love story. And uh, they got married, and I was the firstborn boy. Uh, and I have a little brother, and we were raised together in a pretty standard house with a, uh, a mom and a dad, although my dad traveled a lot for work. Generally, he was home until I was in sixth grade, and then he took a job that kept him gone for the, um, for the weeks, and he'd be home on weekends. Being in the middle of my dad's career curve, from fourth grade on, I was a new kid in school every year, and I was small. It was scary, and uh, there, was, there was a lot of bullying that was going on. I missed dad more than I really was aware of then. We went to church. I think that was a deal that mom and dad made. He stopped smoking cigarettes and, and he did. He took up the pipe instead. And I think that was a bit of a taking advantage of their agreement. Uh, I never really felt like dad was comfortable there. He would, uh, my brother and I can both tell you stories of um, dad clipping his fingernails in the middle of a, a church service. And uh, I, I don't know how conscious that was. Uh, he did a lot of drawing. He figured a lot of things out. He would have a problem to solve, so he'd have his Bible open and he'd make sketches and notes. And uh, then uh, he would stand beside me with his hand on my shoulder during the, uh, uh, the endless, seemingly endless altar calls at, at the end. My brother walked the aisle. Uh, and a couple weeks later, I, uh, not to be outdone by my brother, I walked the aisle as, as well to, to the extreme pleasure of my mother and all the women in the church. Um, and I somehow had the impression that life is going to get better uh, the next day. Suddenly, magically, I'll, I'll be transformed and that all my problems will go away. Not that as a 12-year-old I had lots of problems, but as a 12-year-old, that's every 12-year-old life is hard for 12-year-olds. 
Reflecting on my dad, dad didn't come to my sporting events. Uh, and when he did, he was distracted. He was talking with his friends. Uh, I, I recall one time in particular in Little League, I hit a home run and bounced the ball off the car. They would park the cars, uh, bounce the ball off the car next to him. And it made this thud and they looked and then they looked up and there was me running around the, the bases. So he never came to my wrestling matches, any of them. And uh, I sort of held that against him to a certain degree. So part of my story I, I tell is that I was scared at home uh, because my dad would over-discipline and I don't, I don't think he was real comfortable coming off the ranch uh, and into the city life where um, suits and ties ran the day uh, and college degrees. I, I don't think he did real well at that and there was a lot of anger involved in that for him. He took that out on his oldest son, I remember, several times. I had this relationship where I, I kind of didn't talk to dad much because I couldn't hoe the garden right. I had trouble mowing the yard right. And he was largely disappointed in my grades. Remember, we moved a lot, so my grades really struggled with new school districts. So the result was that I ended up in the hospital with stomach ulcers at age 14. And uh, that got my parents' attention. Um, but it also got the attention of my youth pastor who came and called on me and I just felt like I've walked the aisle so all my problems should be done. I feel more guilty after coming to faith than I did before. And he was so kind um, and he taught me some verses to memorize. And I memorized those verses uh, because I felt like they were gonna set me free. And they had a profound effect on me, but I think more so was just his intentional connecting with my life, his um, uh, not just on Sunday mornings at youth group, if you will, but his intentionally looking for me and saying, you're okay. And I think I met the Lord uh, when I was 14 because of uh, a church that cared enough to, before they could probably really afford him, bring uh, young Pastor Dave Grant onto their staff. He's one of many people who saved my life. I ended up leaving home at uh, about my 16th birthday for uh, very good reasons, and it was a perfect uh, remedy for me. I uh, was approached by some folks uh, as a sophomore about being the All-American exchange student. We'd like you to represent our school. Have you ever thought about going to Japan in this mutual exchange? Your host brother will come to this school and you will go to his school. You'll live in each other's families. So I went to Japan for uh, a year as a high school student. I could pick up language real quick, and I studied judo for the entire year. So I came home from Japan, and my folks had moved again, believe it or not. But the world was my oyster, and I stepped into that school, and I just knew these kids were going to love me. And I turned out for the football team, and I'd never played football before, but I had got some size on me then at that point. Played football, started lifting weights, uh, turned out for the baseball team, and, and it was varsity through all of that. Uh, I was a popular kid, and once won, I think, Mr. Personality Award, having just arrived at this, this school. So uh, all of my tools that I had gained really paid off. They, they turned out to be the things that would be my undoing later, things that I had learned to do to compensate for being afraid, to compensate for feeling small. Uh, these skills were mitigating the pain of that so I could be athletic and I didn't feel small anymore. I could be popular so I felt included. And uh, all of those addictions and compulsions really got reinforced. Um, you don't see them as addictions and compulsions when you're young. They're, of course, they're what I have to do to survive. They're working for me. 
and what was a tool became an addiction uh, and became then later becomes compulsions. I have to be popular. I have to be liked. Uh, I have to be athletic or seen as heroic. I have to be seen as confident. It's embarrassing. It really is embarrassing for me to say, but it was there. And there's a point when those tools fail. Then I went off to Bible school, traveled from to the other side, literally the other side of the nation to go to Bible school. A couple years later, got married, and I went pretty traditional route in, with the marriage and making babies and buying a house and, and working at a, at a job that would make enough money, even though it might not be a job I liked, I make enough money so I could do those things. There was a point because of this youth pastor's work in my life that I decided to try to reconcile with that. And the only way I knew how to do that was to confess my stuff. And dad retired early, so they decided to move into our hometown. And I can remember one time holding a flashlight for dad, doing a project on his job, and not able to hold the flashlight just right, you know, kind of trying to get it down in there with that particularly hard nut in, in the alternator, wherever it was, and dad snapping at me, and it take me right back to six years old when I couldn't hold the flashlight right or whatever it was. It, it took me back to, I really am not gonna be a man like you think a man should be. And, which, by the way, I think that, that was my dad's agenda for me, be a man. And I felt again at 24 years old, you're not going to be a man. You can't even hold the flashlight right. You're not even doing the mechanics. You can't. And I went into a funk for a couple months and I said, I'm not doing this again. I got to talk to dad. So we took a hunting trip. We left uh, Mount Vernon, Washington, headed up for the three-hour drive over uh, the North Cross Highway. We got to about Washington Pass, and I've since the moment we left, I have determined this is the weekend, this is the weekend. But two hours of this trip have been miserable, me sitting there knowing I'm going to face my dad, have a showdown again, if you will. And I feel like the Spirit of God just touched me, dark at Washington Pass, it's almost to Winthrop. And I pulled over to the side of the road, put my hand on Dad's knee and said, Dad, we gotta talk, I gotta tell you something. He was not expecting that. And I, I told him, Dad, I've held a grudge against you for 10 years. And you've probably known that I've avoided you, but I get it now that I'm married. You were working, so you couldn't be there. And when you came home on the weekends, you wanted to cram a, a week's full of parenting into two days or maybe just a moment out in the shop. And But the effect on that on me, Dad, was, hey, where were you on Tuesday when I needed you? You weren't there. And then you come home and want to be super dad. And it didn't work, Dad. I forgive you for that. I don't know how else to do this, but can we talk about that? And by this time, his hand is on top of mine. And mind you, I'm full grown at this point. His hand was still bigger than mine. And this was the hand that put its arm on me in church. I knew that hand is comfort. It was also the hand that beat the hell out of me. I knew it as pain. He put his hand on top of mine. He said, I'm so sorry. I am really sorry. And it was gone. Most things in life aren't gone like that. But that was gone. Had he said, hey, wait, 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 just a minute. That's not the way it went down. Or, hey, I'll bet you know how that feels now that you got your own. Had he even tried to defend himself, I would have gone into a hole again for another 10 years. He said, I'm sorry. But I, I will tell you that after that, we were best buddies. And as, as much as a 24-year-old and a 62-year-old can be best buddies, we did a lot of stuff together. And I think Dad respected what I was doing in my career and in my family. And I think we had cleared the air, and I think it was man to man. I so wanted that affirmation from Dad and so wanted to be affirmed from him and by him on his terms. I didn't want 
him to say, you're a good boy, because I know those weren't his terms. And I knew that Bible school wasn't his terms. Changing a flat on the side of the road in a snowstorm, those were dad's terms. What a gift he gave me by stepping off of his um, platform and willing to change and adjust the relationships. And those things really catapulted our relationship. And uh, I was with dad as he died. And some of his last words were, I know what you've done. I know where you're at in your life. You're way ahead of where I was at at that point in my life. I'm proud of you. Although Mark's relationship with his father was difficult, and getting to the point of letting God restore their bond was no easy task. In the end, they reaped the rewards of reconciliation. Mark wraps up his time with us by reflecting on what it means to face adversity and includes a passage of Jesus' calling as an encouragement to all of us in facing tough times. Those who expect life to be easy will have a terrible time. And Sarah writes here, expect to encounter adversity in your life, remembering that you live in a deeply fallen world. Um, that is such an important perspective. Our day is not going to go the way we want it to. And we have this idea it was a good day or it was a bad day. Well, to me, every day's got not divided up into good and bad, but easy and hard. And then there are certain times when it just is hard, but it's none of it's good or bad because what's, what's a bad thing one day might be the thing that saved you the next. Uh, life is really tough and adversity comes every single day and it should come every single day. I would hate to, to know myself or to hang out with people who had never had adversity. I wouldn't want to be around them. I want to be around people who have scars, who are willing to talk about them and not afraid to show them. And I love the stories. Every scar has a story and I want to know the story. To find out more about Mark Eaton's ministry or to see he and his wife Susie in concert at a venue near you, please visit eatonleadership.org. Stay tuned for our next interview with country music singer-songwriter Kelsey Lamb after a brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Are you looking for a way to keep track of your daily prayers along with Jesus Calling? The Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar goes right along with your daily readings from Jesus Calling. Each day begins with a guided reflection, followed by a space for you to fill in your prayers of thanksgiving and special requests. You can get your free Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar by visiting jesuscalling.com slash offers. Visit jesuscalling.com slash offers to download your free family prayer calendar today. As a little girl, country music singer-songwriter Kelsey Lamb learned the powerful ways that music can help us express our emotions, especially when they feel overwhelming to us. To pay it forward, Kelsey's mission with her music is to be a voice for young girls trying to figure out who they are and where they're going. Kelsey recently moved to Nashville and released her first single called Little by Little. She's navigated big changes in her life and career, and Kelsey can see God walking beside her through it all. My name is Kelsey Lamb. I'm originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, born and raised, um, moved to Nashville about two years ago to pursue music. So I grew up in a very musical family. Um, none of us really play instruments, but we all can sing. So we all grew up like harmonizing and we grew up singing in church together in church choirs, singing solos. And we did talent shows. Me and my sister did a talent show together. We sang My Heart Will Go On. <laughs> <laughs> together. It was cute. <laughs> me and my dad came to Nashville together. My parents gave me as a birthday present to come to Nashville when I was like 15, 16. And I came here and recorded a few songs. Still, you know, you really don't know what it means to like come and just, I didn't write any of them, just came and recorded some songs. I was probably 17 when I realized like, this is it. Like, I really want to like pursue a career out of this, not just a hobby. And then um, I think my biggest transition into knowing that I wanted to like be a part of the songwriting and tell my story through my music, I worked at a summer camp in California called Pally Overnight Adventures. I think that's the name of it still, Pally Adventures maybe. Um, and it's kind of a unique camp. You go and you have like a specialty that you do. And I was in Rockstar Camp. And 
I ended up working at the Rockstar Camp. I went for like five years before that. And you basically write songs and you record a song and you do music videos and you perform it at the end of like the week. And I went as a counselor one year and I wrote a song with this little boy who was like really homesick and we just kind of hashed it out in a song. And he was like really thankful and we performed it. He learned how to play guitar for the first time and we performed it on stage together. And I was like, that's cool. Like, I want to do this. Like, I want like my music to touch people the way that it touched him when we wrote it together. My purpose through my music, it's always been a mission for me, like my mission, and to just kind of help people get through situations. It just helps people get through things. It celebrates with people, and almost all of my songs come from personal experiences. My breakups and moving to Nashville and college and just all of that is in my music hoping to help someone else get through it. This is really funny, but I grew up listening to Avril Lavigne. She really connected with me. And listening to her music got me through a lot of like heartbreak. And then it also like made me sassy. You know, it just kind of like resonated with my personality a lot. And I think that especially a lot of young girls are kind of afraid to let their personality shine because they're just afraid that they're gonna be judged or they're afraid that being sad is bad, you know, to like go through heartbreak openly. And so I think that music for me helped me like get through that without having to like show the world, hey, I'm sad. You know, I could just kind of like do it in my room or in my car with music. And that's what I hope that my music is, especially for young girls, to just feel like they have a friend in my music. When I'm writing a song, the easiest part about writing is the titles for me. So I usually come into a writing session with a list of titles and storylines. I like to touch on obviously things that are personal to me when I'm writing for my project. Little by Little was written with two guys here in Nashville, Eric DiNardo and Jesse LaBelle. And I basically, it was kind of a weird writing process. I brought the title into um, Eric DiNardo and it was kind of like a first date because it was a first writing session. So super awkward. We got the first chorus written and then we brought that concept to Jesse LaBelle who actually like really helped us bring the song to life and just make a cute, a cuter storyline out of it. For me, taking life little by little, in a sense, I do Pilates every day, and that's kind of how I like recenter myself for the most part, I just kind of like be alone with myself and like get away from the chaos, you know, to help me like push to the next day and just like, I do a devotional every single morning. I didn't for a while, but I've come back to kind of Jesus Calling, actually, I've started doing a lot um, every morning just reading that and kind of it's weird because when you like jump back into devotionals you start to realize that it's like every day is every devotion ends up being completely applied to what you're going through it's so weird I have started to notice that like I'll read a devotion that's like I'm really stressed out and the devotion is talking about stress or moving forward or overcoming it and so that's kind of how I try to stay on my path so now I'm going to read a passage from Jesus Calling. I'm going to read the January 5th passage. You can achieve the victorious life through living in deep dependence on me. People usually associate victory with success, not falling or stumbling, not making mistakes. But those who are successful in their own strength tend to go their own way, forgetting about me. It is through problems and failure, weakness and neediness that you learn to rely on me. True dependence is not simply asking me to bless what you have decided to do. It is coming to me with an open mind and heart, inviting me to plant my desires within you. I may infuse within you a dream that seems far beyond your reach. You know that in yourself you cannot achieve such a goal. Thus begins your journey of profound reliance on me. It is a faith walk taken one step at a time, leaning on me as much as you need. This is not a path of continual success, but of multiple failures. However, each failure is followed by a growth spurt, nourished by increased reliance on me. Enjoy the blessedness of a victorious life through your dependence on me. God has definitely played a huge part in this. I went to college before I moved to Nashville. My parents encouraged me to go get a degree. You know, you never know if music is gonna work out, unfortunately. It's kind of a hit or miss, one in a million kind of situation. Um, but once I graduated college, I stayed at home for about a year and a half, and I just like knew I was supposed to come to Nashville. You can just like feel it when you're not on the right path, 
and you feel like there's just like something you gotta do to make yourself just feel like at home, complete, like you're going the right direction. But I definitely feel like God has kind of just pulled me along the way. You know, just keeps opening doors that I'm like, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> and just like, just not necessarily giving me things, but helping me get to the next step, you know, as I work towards it. And I don't think that it'll ever just be handed to me. I think that he puts opportunities in my path to help me work to get to the next step. So he's definitely got a huge hand in all of this, and I feel it every day. If you'd like to hear more stories about people working through their heartbreaks and scars to help others, check out our interview with former WWE wrestlers Ted DiBiase and Mark Marrow. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with world champion steer rover Tyson Durfee and his wife, country singer Shay Fisher. Tyson had long strived to win a national rodeo finals championship. As he approached the end of a difficult year of competition, it looked like his efforts would end up in disappointment until he heard a word from God that gave him peace. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. And sometimes you have to be put through the fire so you can be refined. On the seventh go-round of the national finals, uh, I am in the shower, just get done out of the shower, and I'm putting the towel over my face, and the, 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 the Lord just like spoke to me immediately. And he said that, I am with you. And I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now just talking about it. And I'm like, I just wanted to like fall down on my knees and cry because I was so, you know, shook by it. From that moment, coming out of the shower, I knew I was going to be the world champion. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel on IGTV or on JesusCalling.com slash video.